Okay, uh, we continue. Uh, next talk uh, will be presented by Sergey Pronin, uh, group uh, product manager in Percona. He will tell us why you may want to have private the bus. Hello, everyone. Thank you for staying. We had like 60 people and now it's around 20, which is not so bad. So, huh? Okay, okay. Cool, so let's start. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about private DBAS and uh, how and why behind it. So uh, the agenda is simple. We're gonna go through uh, what database as a service is. We're gonna look into private versus public DBAS quickly, why private, and how Percona approaches private DBAS story as a whole. So DBAS, database as a service. The goal of every DBAS is just to hide the scary complexity of databases from developers and from DBAs as well, right? So the way it works is someone clicks a button in the UI or goes to the API and says, give me a database or give me something and some magic is happening and the output of this magic is that the developer gets a connection stream. Developer can connect to the database, do some good development stuff. And DBAs, what they get is some observability metrics that they can use to help developers to optimize the application, for example, and so on. And both our personas, they have access to API and UI, obviously, to manage all this circus, right? So, as for the use cases, obviously for a developer, the beauty here is that developer gets a self-service. So developer doesn't know, need to go to somebody and ask for a database. It just works, you click a button and it works. Also developer gets the automation. What it means is that if you have your own CI-CD pipeline, it just works again, right? You have it in your test suite or somewhere, the database is provisioned and you can test your application when you develop. For DBA, well, I believe the biggest use case or the biggest pro here is that you remove toil. What does it mean? You don't need to do any manual work. You have it up and running by click of a button and also DBAS takes care of backups, scaling and so on, so you again can manage your databases through clicking and so on. And for business, it is important that business gets uh, compliance. Uh, what does it mean is that all your databases that you deploy through DBAS, hopefully, they are standardized in some way, they are secure in some way and so on, so you kind of make sure that, okay, I, I will not, like, my, my data is not going to leak somewhere, I will not, like, expose 1,000 customers or billions of customers to outside world, right? So it's compliance and get stuff done because developers and DBAs, they have more time to do good stuff uh, for the company versus working on databases because databases are dull. Yeah, it's me saying from Percona. Uh, there are two types of DBAS, private and public. Uh, for public, well, obviously it's public clouds. Amazon RDS or Aurora, it is uh, Google Cloud SQL. Uh, there is a company called Avon. Anyone ever heard about it? Avon, no? Okay, good. So yeah, there is such a company. What they do is they allow you to deploy various databases in public clouds as well. So they provide you a SaaS interface, you click a button, you get a database. Pretty good. MongoDB Atlas is another beast, very famous. You can get MongoDB from them. Right, so it's public DBAS examples. What do you have in private? Well, in private, you have manual. It's my favorite way of DBAS, right? You create a service desk ticket and say, I need a database. And then 10 days later, you get a database. Oh, it's not working. Oh yeah, I'm gonna fix it. And then 20 days later, you get a database. That's manual approach, widely popular. Don't use it. Do-it-yourself automation, uh, it's another popular example that I see a lot in various companies, is when 
you evaluate from manual to do it yourself. You create bash scripts to create database or Ansible or Terraform. You have a lot of ways to do that. And then you have a huge team maintaining this all. And they maintain it, they support it, they upgrade it. So it's do it yourself, but it, it's much better than manual for sure because it provides the speed at least of development. And the last one is vendor solutions. There are lots of vendors like Percona, several nines, uh, Stackgrass, Ongress, um, many other companies, they provide you a solution to build your own private DBS. So let's compare it a bit. That's kind of my comparison. Maybe it's not fully what you expected to see, but when you compare private and public, first you think, okay, can I run it on-prem? What does it mean in your own data center? You have an old-fashioned data center, you're not a cloud person, so can I run it? Well, for private, definitely. For public, well, partially. Partially is because public clouds, for example, Amazon, they provide you with a solution called Amazon Outposts. You can run your own private Amazon cloud in your data center, and you can have your own RDS in your data center. So it's partially. Vendor lock-in. So with public, it's clear, right? You have Amazon RDS, and the lie that Amazon tells you is that, well, it's the same MySQL. Well, yes, it is. But at the same time, you start using IAM roles. You start using Redshift for analytics. You start using something for backups like S3 and so on. And you now have 20 Amazon services that it's really hard to escape if you want to move to some other cloud or to on-premise or somewhere. With private, I say it's low. I'm not saying it's none. Why it is low? Because, um, for example, if you use some company and you pay this company money for licenses, if you stop paying, they're going to revoke the licenses and you're going to lose your private DBS. Well, uh, for Percona, for example, we're an open source company. So you're not paying us anything, only for support. So if you stop paying us, you still have a working product. So it's no vendor lock-in. Price. Public clouds, well, definitely they, are, they cost more. In uh, private, you're still going to need to pay for infrastructure, but it's not comparable. Control over data. It's something that is very important for enterprise customers, banks, or some, some organizations that work with sensitive data, like hospitals or medical organizations, they need to be compliant. And for public, again, there is a lie that you have control over your data. You don't. You don't know where your data is. You don't know how it's stored, who has access to it. It's a cloud, right? It can be leaking somewhere. Well, in private, you have control over your data. It's just the question, can you make sure that it's not leaking from your company and uh, you know what you're doing? Then maintenance. Maintenance, I mean, well, obviously, how much money are you going to spend on uh, headcount? Like, how many people do you need to hire to maintain your private DBAS? Well, for public, I'm saying, I'm honest, it's super low. You don't need a lot of people to maintain public DBAS. And for private, it's medium, but it can be high. So I'm, I'm lying a bit here, so sorry. Uh, why we decided that private DBAS matters at Percona, right? Well, first of all, we see customers coming to us with a problem saying, we have billion scripts now to maintain our databases in private. We deploy them, we're happy but we are not that happy that we want to continue doing that. We want to stop doing it. We want someone to help us. And another one is very important for Percona is that we at Percona understand how hard it is to run a database that just works. And we provide fine tuning. We ensure that the databases are deployed with best practices in mind. So you just don't run uh, an out-of-the-box installation of MySQL, like uh, I don't see Roman, but he was giving a good presentation today on tuning, on the importance of tuning the database. And if you don't tune it, well, it's not running well. So 
That's why we decided that private DBAS is a good thing so we can come to our customers and users with some solution that will just make it their lives a bit easier and the deployment of database is a bit more fun. So let's talk about the house behind how we approach it. Ananias is here, I think, but he was talking about operators. And guess what? We chose Kubernetes and operators at Percona uh, as our solution for databases uh, as a service. The reasons behind it is Kubernetes is widely popular. So if you are using Kubernetes or know something about the CNCF community, you would see that in the latest report of CNCF, they say that 96% of organizations ever tried or thought or already run Kubernetes. Maybe it's not true, but definitely it's rising, right? And every year more and more companies are using it. Kubernetes runs anywhere. You can run it in public clouds, you can run it on-prem, you can run it on your Raspberry Pi, you can run it on your phone, in your Tesla, whatever, right? It just runs anywhere you have a computer. And uh, right now what we also see is that Kubernetes is not only a container orchestration system, it turns into like operating system for cloud native workloads where instead of thinking, okay, this is my Linux machine and this is my kubelet, people start thinking, okay, this is my Kubernetes and this is where I'm going to run the application with the operator. So it's like an operating system. And uh, for operators, well, operators are just automating management of the applications and running over the applications in Kubernetes. That's it. And for Percona, we have operators for MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. The most common question that I receive is why are you not using something like Terraform, Pulumi, Ansible instead of Kubernetes, right? Why have you decided? And the reason is super simple because number one, it's really hard to make Terraform, for example, work on-prem. Yeah, I understand there can be some providers for VMware, but what if it's not VMware, where it's like bare metal? Then I need to write my own, uh, how it's called, model or provider for Terraform to deploy on-prem? Well, it's pretty hard. And uh, again, for us as a company, there are at least three major clouds, Amazon, Google, and Azure. And for us, we need to maintain this Terraform or Pulumi or Ansible code for all these clouds, ensure that it's up to date, and it's a lot of work. But for Kubernetes, we don't need that, because Kubernetes runs anywhere, and it's standardized across all the environments. We don't need to think about it, so it's simpler. Uh, one of the things I think PZ Peter was showing it today as well, is that operators are not greenfield anymore. Greenfield technology means like, well, it's something new and funny, right? But if you look around, there are lots of companies who run operators in production. There is this community, DOK, uh, Data on Kubernetes, and recently in KubeCon, it was two weeks ago, they released this new report, and they say that 81% of the companies, they already use operators to deploy something in Kubernetes for stateful workloads. So it's a lot, 81% for me is a lot. And uh, the companies here, for example, PlanetScale, they use Kubernetes operator to empower or ignite their uh, cloud solution for uh, MySQL Vitas. Ever, anyone ever used Vitas? No? Yeah, Vitas is hard. Uh, IBM Cloud. Any database that you deploy in IBM Cloud runs on Kubernetes. Nokia Broadcom, these two are our customers and they use our operators to build their own private DBS. Pure Storage is the company behind Portworks. They recently released their database as a service solution as well. It's also powered by operators and they run data on Kubernetes. VMware, they have a set of their own operators to run databases on Tanzu, very popular. CockroachDB, anyone use CockroachDB? Okay, next slide. So, how do operators work? Okay, how do operators work? So on the right you have a Kubernetes, on the left you have a 
developer. And what does developer do? It just defines what developer wants to get. I want MySQL cluster with three nodes, uh, some kind of replication, storage, backups done like that, monitoring, proxy. He defines something, right? He, developer, she, or he, presses enter, and then magic happens. On the right, you see something appeared. So this is what we were talking at the very beginning. This is what operators are doing. They masquerade all this complexity. You hit a button, you get a database up and running, you don't know what is happening there, you just get an endpoint that you connect to, and you start using your database. That's it. Then, obviously, for DBAs, probably, and maybe for developers as well, it's very important to execute some day two operations. Scale, backup, upgrade, whatever. With operators as well, it's only a matter of uh, defining what you want to get. I want a backup. I want a backup uploaded to S3 bucket. I want to restore. I want it to do like this. And again, you send it to Kubernetes API with a YAML file or manifest, and as a result, you get the result. That's it. And you don't know what is happening in the background. Operator takes care of it, and Kubernetes takes care of it. Um, so how do I build private DBS with operators? Well, there are like three main patterns that we see uh, in Percona, first one is developers, they get direct access to Kubernetes. So you just, as a DBA or as a system administrator, you tell developer what to do. Here's an access with some strict role-based role access control. Just run this command, you're going to get the database. That's it, period. Another one is obviously through CI CD pipelines, where you have Jenkins, GitOps, Terraform, Helm, whatever you know how it works, and you just integrate it with your Kubernetes cluster. And the last one is we see it with Nokia, for example. They have their own NESC platform. It's something that they developed internally, and they just integrate it somehow with our operators and Kubernetes. So it's just similar to number two, like automation and CI CD, but with some enterprise-ish flavor on top of it. Uh, Okay, so it still feels do-it-yourself. So in PMM, per corner monitoring management, we have a database as a service capability. So it just provides you the UI and API. If you don't want to know how Kubernetes work or how operators work, you can install PMM and you get something like this. So as a developer, you talk to PMM only uh, through API or UI, and then all the magic on the right is happening again, but you don't need to learn Kubernetes or know anything about Kubernetes at all. As a developer, well, you just click a button again and you get the database up and running. This is what private, how private DBAS works. And at the same time, for DBAs, you still get observability, you still get management capabilities, so you can restore backup. You get your insights like query analytics, and you can integrate still freely with any other solution. Well, it's open source world. So to recap, there are three ways how you can build your private DBS with Percona. First one is, and painful one is manual or do it yourself. DYI, do it yourself. Uh, private DBS with operators widely popular, and private DBAS with PMM, so if you don't want to touch Kubernetes and it's scary, go for it. Yeah, thank you. Questions? Okay, I did my job well. No questions. <laughs> thank you, everyone.